All right, friends, it's time to give you loyal listeners a discount on protein powder. You may or may not know, but I launched my very first protein powder two years ago. It's a grass-fed beef isolate with only three ingredients, grass-fed beef, either organic cacao or organic vanilla, and organic monk fruit. Now, if you don't want any of the added flavor and sweeteners, you can also just get unflavored. And no matter what flavor you choose, you're getting over 23 grams of protein per scoop, which is gonna keep you full and satisfied between meals. I love starting my day with a Fab Four smoothie and breaking my fast with that much protein. It makes a serious difference in my cravings and blood sugar balance the rest of the day, and I've seen it with my clients as well. Now, I never thought I'd own a product company, but when I got pregnant with Sebastian, I realized the majority of protein powders were chemically extracted or enzymatically extracted, and I wanted to use heat and water only. I wanted minimal ingredients because we don't need those emulsifiers, fillers, or added vitamins, minerals, and probiotics. All of those additions increase the chances that it's not gonna work for your body, whether it be bloating, digestion issues. I just wanted pure clean protein to keep you full and satisfied so you could build the most delicious Fab Four smoothie. And I have to say, I'm pretty proud of the flavor. If you take a look at our reviews on Amazon, you'll see five-star reviews for flavor. And that is key because if you don't love your Fab Four smoothie and you don't love drinking your protein powder, you're not gonna do it. It won't become a habit and it's consistency that outpaces everything. So. If you're here and you're listening and you want to give our protein powder a try, use the code PODCAST5 for $5 off your order. And let me know if you love it. My favorite ways to apply this protein powder is in my Fab Four smoothie, making freezer fudge, making chocolate milk, making hot chocolate, and throwing the unflavored into all my kids' baked goods. So let me know how you use it. Let me know if you love it. And share this podcast deal with your friends. Super excited about today's guest. Her name is Carly Stein, and she is the founder of Beekeepers Naturals. She's going to tell you her personal story of how propolis helped her and her immune system when antibiotics weren't working and when her body was inflamed and under attack. It is a beautiful story of finding healing and creating a company to help others. I am so interested in everything she has to say on today's show. I actually joke in the show that she takes us back to bee school because you're going to learn all of the byproducts of bees, how to protect them, um, and how you can use their byproducts to better your health. So before we get into it, I just want to let you guys know that Both of my online courses are available, the Fab Four Fundamentals and the Fab Four Pregnancy. They're going to go through how to balance your blood sugar, eat for satiety, eat the most nutrient-dense foods, no matter what season of life you're in. And I couldn't be more proud of the information that I put out in both of those courses. Um, So both of those are available on the website, along with the Be Well by Kelly Levesque protein powder. So we're shipping vanilla, chocolate, and unflavored. It's 100% grass-fed beef isolate from Sweden. There's only three ingredients, organic monk fruit and organic flavoring, either organic cacao or organic vanilla. So minimal ingredients, a complete protein with all your branched chain amino acids and a bunch of collagen amino acids too. So go check it out. And uh, without further ado, we'll get to the show. Well, Carly, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to join me on the podcast. I'm really excited to dive in to how you became obsessed with bees, started a whole company around honey. And and I really just want our audience to understand how and why bees are so important, what's happening to their population, like what we can do to help. Yeah. So let's start from the beginning. Like why bees? (laughs) Great question. (laughs) So uh, bees, I kind of like fell into this world and thank goodness I did because it is my whole life now. Um, But it really started with my autoimmune condition and my health challenges. So growing up, I had chronic tonsillitis. I don't know if any listeners have dealt with tonsillitis, but it's pretty painful. And I, I had it chronically. And then I'm also autoimmune, so I can't take antibiotics. So antibiotics and most, basically most strains of antibiotics, I have a pretty severe allergic reaction to. And then even most OTC medicine, you're like, NyQuil's and neocitrins of the world, I have a pretty aggressive allergic reaction when I take those. So growing up, I was this little kid who was constantly sick with no solution. And from a pretty early age, that got me 
fascinated with the world of natural wellness. And I would spend a lot of time researching and I would save up for these different superfoods that made big, bold claims and had celebrity faces on them and all of the nice branding things. And I would use these different products. And I ended up just time and time again, becoming very, very frustrated with the lack of results. And so I was in this weird space where I was obsessed with the world of natural wellness, but also really disillusioned as a consumer because I just felt like it's all kind of BS and a lot of it doesn't work. Hmm. And then I just couldn't take conventional medicine, but I was always sick. And growing up, I would miss like three weeks of school at a time. I was sick at least once a month. It was pretty bad. And what were what were your autoimmune diseases, if you don't mind me asking? And what was okay. your reaction to antibiotics and OTC medications? So what, I have a really crazy skin reaction. So when I take antibiotics and certain OTC medications, it basically causes like an eczema-like manifestation all over my skin. So it kicks my immune system into overdrive and then I start overproducing skin cells. So I get like almost like adult chicken pox. Well, now I'm an adult, but almost like a chicken pox like reaction. Wow. And it can last, the longest it lasted was six months. Wow. It, you know, very, very painful hives, head to toe, like itching to the point where I'm bleeding, that sort of thing. And so, and, and also, you know, lasting for God knows how long. So it was just kind of this really strange reaction to most medicine. And every time I took something, it was a huge gamble and it could work out in a really poor way. So that was just kind of how it was. And I, I had to be you know, incredibly skeptical of everything I put in my body. And that's on the food front as well. But specifically with medicine, it was just so frustrating because I was constantly sick with something that most people would just you know take an antibiotic or take some sort of numbing agent or something like that and at least get rid of the symptoms. And I was left with like a burning sensation every time I swallowed or took a big breath. And so it was just really, it was one of those weird invisible illness situations where it was really affecting my life quality, but you know, it wasn't life threatening. And so I was just, I was really isolated. And I, growing up, I saw every Western practitioner, every specialist, every ear, nose, and throat doctor. And then as I got you know, into my teen years, every naturopath, acupuncturist. So I really explored all areas of wellness. And I found some incredible tools and some things I've carried with me to this day. But ultimately, I was met with a huge amount of frustration and really frustrated with the system and just feeling incredibly isolated in what is supposed to be the system that helps you solve problems and find answers. And that was just really how it was for me. And that continued up until university. And when I was in college, I did a semester abroad. And uh, I, was, I was studying in Sweden, but I was in Italy at the time that I got really sick. And so this is in 2012. So that was like my third year of university. Um, so I was studying in Sweden. I was traveling around and I had just landed in Italy. And I started to come down with pretty severe tonsillitis and it, it really rapidly progressed. And it was so bad that I was having a really hard time breathing. And I, I thought I was going to have to come home. And I was just so devastated. I was like, I busted my butt waitressing to get out here. It was my first big trip abroad. And I, I just was like, you know what? I don't want to miss out on something that I've worked for again. Like I'm always kind of on the bench. And so I was looking for anything that I could possibly take to help solve the problems that I was dealing with. And I went into a pharmacy in Florence and I spoke to the pharmacist. I riddled off the long list of things I'm allergic to and spoke to her about my symptoms. And she was like, oh, you need propolis. And I was like, okay, what's propolis? And she's like, you know, from the bees. And I was like, oh, so... <laughs> Like, yeah, me. totally from the bees. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, you, you must like this must be a, a language situation. Like, <laughs> she's like, no, 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 not honey. Totally different. Propolis, and she gives me this tincture with like no writing on it. There was maybe like a string of Italian words, um, and she's like, just take this, take it. And she, she gave me like the instructions on how to use this tincture, and she assured me that I wouldn't have 
it wouldn't, you know, cause a crazy reaction. She seemed pretty confident and also pretty relaxed about it. So I was like, wow, people are really chill in Europe. (laughs) Um, But I took this stuff and I think normally I would have been a little bit more skeptical. And I was also 21 at the time, but uh, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to try it. And I started using it and you know, right away, I was super scared to take it. And my roommates were like on call to make sure that I didn't have some crazy reaction. Um, But I felt fine taking it. And in about five days, it really got rid of my tonsillitis. And so basically what happened for me was propolis functioned in my body the way antibiotics do for most people and for me without the adverse reaction. And that was my first real experience of healing. Like I just struggled with an illness that would linger for so long for so many years. And using this propolis, it was my honest first experience of taking something and actually getting better. Um, So that was kind of a big moment for me and really kind of rocked my world there. And then I started, of course, I hit Google pretty hard trying to figure out what propolis actually is. And I started learning about these different bee products going beyond honey. So the more kind of medicinal, less conventional bee products, things like propolis and royal jelly and bee pollen and reading about the medicinal effects. And I continued using propolis as a consumer. And as I traveled around Europe, and Europe's so progressive with natural health, I started to notice that they have these bee products in like traditional pharmacies. Like I could go to a corner store pharmacy in most places I was traveling to in Europe and find propolis for you know, immune support. And when I was in France, I remember seeing all these brain supplements with royal jelly. And so I just kind of caught on to the fact that these differentiated bee products have actually been playing a major role in our medical history, kind of across cultures. And they're just kind of unknown in North America. And so I was using all this stuff, feeling better than ever, and not even a little bit thinking about starting a company at that time, but I had found my thing and I was really excited. And I was like, I no longer have to struggle with being sick. And I continued my time abroad and I didn't get crazy sick for the rest of my trip, which was unbelievable. Um, my parents like really didn't want me to go abroad, not for reasons that most parents don't want their kid, but because they're like, you're going to get sick and it's, you're going to be in a hospital in a foreign country. Thankfully, that did not happen. And so I was feeling really great, finished up my time abroad, came back home to Canada where I'm from to finish up college. And midterms rolled around. And of course, I got sick again with the stress and the all-nighters. But I wasn't really worried. I was like, you know what? I know what I need. I just need to get my hands on some propolis. So I went to every health food store, you know, strolled in thinking I could just pick some up in the immune section. And nobody knew what I was talking about. There was tons of Manuka honey all over the place. But there was no, you know, pure propolis formula. And generally people didn't really know what I was asking for when I was looking for these different bee products. So I became kind of frustrated with it and I started really aggressively searching and I ended up finding propolis at this farmer's market in Victoria, British Columbia, or actually I think it was on the mainland. It was in Vancouver maybe. And um, I bought this bottle of propolis and it was like $40 and organic and in a beautiful bottle. And I was really excited and I took it home and used it. And I had a really severe allergic reaction. And so I was completely devastated and confused. And at that time, I was a TA for my chemistry class. So I ran a toxicity panel on the product I'd purchased. And I realized what I now know to be a major environmental concern and something that's plaguing the bees. I realized that there was trace amounts of pesticides in this organic product I'd purchased. Mm -hmm. And I was really upset and I started just trying to understand structurally what's happening and what's happening with the beekeeping industry at large and why on earth an organic product would expose me to pesticides. And, you know, I think for most people, it was a pretty small amount of pesticides. It would have made no difference. But for someone with a sensitive system who spent all of this energy seeking out something clean, something different, something that isn't going to cause them harm, and then to be exposed to some of the very toxins that can be a huge challenge for them. It was just such a frustrating experience. And what I learned is that 
the whole principle of organic doesn't really work when it comes to the bees. Because unlike cattle, which you can fence in, or blueberries, which stay in one place, the bees fly and you can't put a leash on them. Yeah. So just because they're on certified organic land doesn't mean they're not flying next door and pollinating the flowers in the neighbor's yard that are covered in neonicotinoids and glyphosate and all kinds of crap. And it doesn't mean that there's not blowover. And the sad state of affairs in the sort of agricultural industry right now is that pesticides are really widely used. And in different parts of the world, like in Europe, where in a lot of places there's a ban against neonicotinoids, um, which is one of the classes of pesticides most commonly used in the U.S. and really directly affecting our bee populations. In North America, there's not a whole lot of regulation. So, you know, not only are these pesticides really affecting the creatures that are responsible for pollinating and helping our environment flourish, but they're hurting people. And so that was kind of my first experience of learning about the inefficiencies and the issues within the beekeeping world. And I was like, okay, well, I know that the bees make these incredible medicines that can be wildly impactful, but clearly there's a not a market for it because nobody knows that these things exist and the benefits of them. And even if there was some sort of market for it, they're not being produced in the quality that can help people. Right. And so, you know, I wasn't, again, I, these were kind of like high level thoughts. I was not thinking about starting a company at that time, but I was like, I just need this stuff for myself. Like I need this stuff to function. And if you want something done right, you have to do it yourself. And clearly people who are working with the bees right now are not exactly protecting them from pesticides. And what if I can do that? So I got online and I found the local beekeeping association. I started going to meetings and I found myself a mentor and I started keeping bees. And I was keeping bees in the forest on Vancouver Island in in Victoria. So it was pretty darn far away from pesticides. Mm -hmm. Um, And I really just had the most incredible education because I was making products for myself. I was, you know, the TA for my chemistry class. So I was able to like collect all these bee products and then go into the lab and play mad scientist. And then at the same time, I was having this kind of no strings attached experience that only a college student can have where I was really just indulging in this hobby um, and really just learning about the bees and the intricate ecosystem that they have and, and how important they are as pollinators for the rest of our world. And so it was, it was kind of this completely self-indulgent search for my own cure and at the same time, my own hobby and kind of passion. And so that's how I started working with the bees and keeping bees. And I started just making these products and without realizing it, I was kind of weaving together what has now become a product line for my company But at that time, I was really just curing myself of the stuff that I'd been dealing with and completely falling in love with the bees at the same time. And so that's really how I got started with that. And I I started at at one point, I started sharing these products I was making with my roommates and friends of friends. And next thing you know, people on campus were Facebook messaging me to buy bee products out of some chick's (laughs) dorm room. So I had this moment where I was like, huh, maybe it's not just me and maybe I'm <laughs> a benefit and maybe this should exist. And I think I told my parents and a few people and everyone was like, jaws on the floor. What are you talking about? That sounds insane. <laughs> like get that idea out of your head right now. And like, please, please, please get a real job. Yeah. Um, and so when it came time for me to graduate, I, you know, I I did have that dream, but I was graduating with negative funds, as many students do. And I was very fortunate to have a job offer as a pharmaceutical researcher in the finance world. And so that's like a nice, good on paper, pay the bills job that my parents felt good about. (laughs) Um, We all do those jobs for a little while. (laughs) So yeah, so I went down that road and I joined this hedge fund. And then 10 months into that, I, I ended up getting recruited by Goldman Sachs. And I joined Goldman as an equity and derivatives trader. And so I was working that like crazy New York finance analyst, 16 plus hours a day and like semi-regular all-nighter lifestyle. And I was super unhappy. My, my mental health just really started to kind of 
much go down the drain. And I think it was a few things. It wasn't the hours. It was really the fact that I was doing something that was so inauthentic. It, for me, it was so far from what I cared about. Like I studied, I did social sciences in my undergrad and my pathway into the finance world was pharmaceutical research. So, you know, it had that sciencey slant that was interesting, but it got to a place where it was more finance than anything else. And I was just kind of surrounded by people in an environment that was really out of line with my values. And I wasn't doing something that I felt like had impact in the way that I want to and that I care about. And I'm super sensitive and that really affected me. And I just became really depressed. And again, the lifestyle was was not exactly helping, but I became really depressed and I did what any type A person does when they're depressed, which is make a spreadsheet about it. And so I made this spreadsheet trying to identify the points in time when I was the happiest in my life. And the things that I kept coming back to were working with the bees, like in, in an apiary out in the forest with the bees and making products. And I couldn't exactly work with the bees because I was splitting time between New York and Toronto and I just couldn't really fit that into my life. But I could order some basic lab equipment off Amazon and order some raw ingredients from my mentor out in British Columbia and make products in my studio apartment just for fun. And so that's what I did. And I, I thought about it, how I kind of made sense of that. Cause I was like, you know what? I have, I have friends who are really amazing at baking and it's just their hobby. And I have all these friends that have these different cool out of work hobbies. Like this will be mine. I'll just after hours after work, I'll make bee products in my studio apartment and I'll give them to my friends for Christmas and make them for myself. And that will be how I kind of fuel myself creatively. So I started doing that and it worked. I was like so excited to come home from work and stay up all night (laughs) making different distillations and just working on these products for myself. And I had a friend who worked at this company that put on pop-ups for small sort of startups and producers and kind of like a farmer's market vibe. And she was like, why don't you come set up a booth and sell your stuff? You have have some weird stuff that you're making. So some people might like it. And I went and did that. I set up a booth at her pop-up shop. And I ended up getting into these really long conversations, mostly with young parents who either had an autoimmune condition, had a kid with an autoimmune condition, or were just really looking to clean up the medicine cabinet for their family and kind of do things differently. And I ended up selling a decent amount of product. I I sold out of what I had, which wasn't much. And I I gave all my personal contact info to basically everyone I had a conversation with. (laughs) And they all kept in touch with me and were sharing these really amazing healing experiences that were, you know, very much reminiscent of what I went through. And they asked me to start sending product. They would order it and I would send it to their sister-in-law in Chicago or you know, their friend in different places. And it got to a point where I put up a website just to handle this, these kind of small one-off sales to different places. And I started doing a few more pop-ups in farmer's markets. And it got to a place where we had real sales and the company was kind of starting to take shape. And I realized someone has got to run this company it's you know we're re- i'm really helping people with these products and how how different would my life have been and how much easier would my struggle have been if i had found these products earlier and so i left goldman end of 2016 and kind of blew up my life every single person i know told me it was an insane idea like it's one thing to tell people you're starting up a product company and then everyone's like oh okay you're making honey and then you're like, no, 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 not honey, medicine with all the other things the bees make. And then everyone's just very confused. So it really didn't make sense to people because there was no precedent for it. And there, there's not you know, much out there that's similar to it. So everyone in my life just thought I was kind of destroying my career for this pipe dream company. Um, but I, I just felt that I had to do it. And I tuned out the voices and went for it. And I've been running Beekeepers Naturals ever since. So that's how I got involved with the bees and became obsessed with them. And that's really my, my healing journey that led me to find my passion. I love so much that you're 
company has come from a place of healing. It's come from a personal experience. I feel like that's, it's, it's laced throughout so many entrepreneurial stories. And you made a really good point, just kind of talking about your experience that it wasn't the hours at, at, you know, working the New York finance job and the golden stacks of the world. It was the fact that you weren't in alignment with like your passion and what was like, what brings you joy? Because I think as an entrepreneur starting your own business, you're going to work as many hours as you worked on Wall Street, but you're going to do it from a place of like excitement and love and energy and abundance. And, and you're, you're actually uncovering a need, which, you know, I, even just you explaining that organic bees or bees grown on organic ground. It's true. I mean, nobody has a leash on bees. So, so what are we doing to protect, to protect these, these medicines as you, as you call them? I'd love for you to go through the science of like, cause, cause propolis, bee pollen, royal jelly, manuka honey, like there are so many of us that don't know the difference between what these products are, what the sources, where they come from, what they're offering, how they work. I would love for you to like break it down so that anyone listening, whether they're a mom with kids or someone with autoimmune diseases, or, you know, because we all get kind of roped in, you're at a farmer's market and someone's like, this is bee pollen. Is it local? And is it organic? And where'd you get it? And like, you know, someone taking big bags of bee pollen and putting them in cute glass jars with their name on it. Like, I don't know, you know? So I'd love for you to just break down the science of what are the byproducts of like beekeeping that are medicinal and when we would use them and how they work. Awesome. I can totally do that. How about I do it this way? I'll go through the different products and I'll also mention the role they play in the hive just so everyone gets a little bit of B101 as well. I love that. That's what we want. B101, little science. Let us let us go uh, treat ourselves, but we, we got to know how it all works. Amazing. So I'll start with honey, which is the one that most of us are probably familiar with. So in the hive, honey is the bee's carbs. It's their main energy source. It's their primary food source. So really just think of it as their source of carbohydrates. And how the bees make honey is they collect it. They collect the base ingredients, which come from floral nectar. So they'll actually, they have this tube-like tongue called the proboscis, and they'll stick it into flowers and suck up all that nectar and then bring it back to the hive Um, let it ferment, take all the moisture out, and eventually it becomes honey. And so honey for the bees, it's, you know, a critical component for their nutrition. And for humans, honey is really well known because it's full of antioxidants. It does have antiviral properties. It's actually really great for relaxation. So when you take honey, it allows a slow, steady spike in insulin, which allows the tryptophan in your body to cross the blood-brain barrier where it's converted into serotonin and then melatonin. So that's why if you've ever heard about somebody taking a teaspoon of honey before bed or honey and chamomile tea, it's a really great tool to help kind of calm the body down. And again, it has all of those great antioxidants and antiviral benefits. Um, It's highly enzymatic. So honey is actually the only food on the planet that never expires which is a testament to the enzyme quality. So it can be really helpful for any sort of digestive issue. And it's something that's helpful to take alongside other nutrients or medicines to support absorption. So I know in traditional Chinese medicine, often people will recommend that you take whatever your medicine is from your acupuncturist or whoever your TCM practitioner may be with a teaspoon of honey just to help your body absorb it and utilize all of it. And so... Manuka honey is a specific strain of honey. It comes from the manuka plant, which is native to New Zealand. It's kind of similar to the eucalyptus plant. And manuka honey became kind of famous for its uh, antiviral capabilities. The truth is all raw high quality honey should have some of that. Manuka can be great, but it's really expensive and you can really get the job done with the high quality raw honey. The best honey varietal and the one that I like to recommend is buckwheat honey. So there was actually a study done looking at all different honey varietals and it found that buckwheat specifically had the highest antioxidant count. And buckwheat honey, it's kind of earthy tasting. It's the really dark colored honey, but you know, if you don't want to pay the fancy price tag of Manuka, you really, really can get the job done with buckwheat honey and it's typically half the price. There was also a really good study that came out a few years back 
looking at buckwheat honey and comparing it to the ingredients in most cough syrup. And this actually frames one of the products that we now have. But what the study was looking at was buckwheat honey versus dextromethorphan, which is the active ingredient in most cough syrup that you would find at like CVS or Walgreens. And it was looking at the effects of both dextro and buckwheat honey for upper pediatric respiratory infections. So looking at kids with respiratory infections. And the study found that buckwheat honey was actually just as effective for upper pediatric respiratory infections as dextromethorphan was. So when I saw the study, I was like, why on earth would we ever give our kids dextro, which is just like a chemical that can, you know, act as a soothing agent over something that's natural and holistic and won't just soothe the issue, but you know, has antioxidants and has enzymes and has other benefits for the body. So anyways, a little bit of a tangent on my obsession with buckwheat honey, but highly recommend buckwheat honey. It's an active ingredient in a lot of the stuff we make. And again, if you want to bypass that Manuka price tag, just any raw buckwheat honey will really do the trick. Really key as well when you're buying honey. I don't worry about local so much. I know that local has always been sort of pushed on us. And I think in the olden days when we were dealing with a local farm that had this rich variance of local foliage, then local made sense specifically when relating to allergies, just mm-hmm. because you're, you're microdosing with the allergen, you're exposing yourself to the local plant life and reducing your allergic response. But nowadays, just economically, like we don't have that structure where a local farm has an abundance of different crop types. It's all monocropping. It's a local farm will be, you know, a dedicated avocado grower or an almond grower, or, you know, they have a specific plant type that they're growing. And because of that, you don't have that variance. And what you often do have is more pesticide exposure because it's all one crop type. So it's very, very vulnerable. So local today is not necessarily the necessarily the benchmark of health and not what I would encourage people to look for unless they're specifically looking to deal with allergies. And even then, I would just caution them. Um, what you really want to look for is raw. You want to, if you can, if you're at a farmer's market, talk to the beekeeper, talk about the richness and the variance in foliage, ask if the bees are exposed to a monocrop ask about not just is this organic because like we kind of discussed, organic doesn't really mean much when it comes to bee products. And frankly, a lot of the smaller scale beekeepers don't go for that organic certification because they think it's silly because for bees, it isn't really meaningful. (laughs) Um, So talk to them a little bit about what's happening locally. Are there a lot of kind of mass agro crops in the area? Um, Those are the sorts of questions. If beekeepers we actually, you know, we do things in a little bit of a different way. We practice third-party pesticide testing. So that's how we can really ensure that our products are both pesticide-free for our customers, um, but also pesticide-free so that we're creating a sustainable environment for the bees. So that's something we do, but just something to kind of be aware of when you're buying your honey. Yeah. So it's interesting because you're talking about local honey. And when I think about like people using honey products or bee products for immunity, I always think, pollen but are we we're getting all of those those micro doses of whatever foliage is happening through our honey as well is what you're saying so we're getting a little bit of it but mm-hmm. not nearly as much as we would with pollen so honey is kind of like the level 1b product i personally will use honey i use it topically all the time it's unbelievable um just as a facial cuz honey's a humectant so it helps to strengthen the moisture barrier I use honey to calm myself down. I use it before bed and I'll use it as like my healthy sweetener. But in terms of the more medicinal capabilities of bee products, the other bee products are a lot more potent. So the next thing I'll talk about, because I just think it's like the Mecca and it certainly was for me is propolis. So propolis you can think of as the immune system of the hive or the bee's medicine. So honey is their food, their carbs. Propolis is their medicine. And, you know, I mentioned honey comes from flowers. The base ingredient of propolis is plant and tree resins. So think of something like sap or that's the sticky substance, the resinous substance that would come out of the trees. That's the base material for what the bees use to make propolis. And so the base ingredient is a little bit more medicinal in nature. It's a little bit more adaptogenic. The bees are literally going out and collecting 
the protective part of the plant. Like that's the part of the plant that is, you know, the plant's immune system. The plant is using to protect itself when it's cut open or anything like that. So the bees are collecting the resinous materials from plant and, plants and trees. They bring it back to their hive, put it through their enzymatic process, and then they make this sticky amber-colored substance called propolis. And how they use it, they use it to line the entire hive to keep it germ-free. So they'll line all the walls of the hive just in case there's any cracks in the walls or anything like that. They'll line the inside of the cell walls for the newborn baby bees to create a sterile environment for newborns. And then they'll even have a propolis mat at the front entrance of the hive so that all the bees can disinfect as they come in. So it's literally like their whole disinfectant, antiviral, like, you know, that it's how they combat outer germs and bacteria. And something really interesting about propolis, let's say a mouse gets into the hive. There's honey and pollen and good stuff happening in there. So a mouse will try to get in. If a mouse gets into the hive, the bees can sting it and kill it but they can't physically pick up a dead mouse and carry it out of the hive. And the problem with that is, let's say the dead mouse just stayed in that hive, it's a decaying rodent. So it would cause a huge amount of disease, just the same way if there was a dead body hanging out in our living room, it would cause a lot of illness for everyone who's existing around it. Right. What the bees will do in that situation is they'll mummify the dead mouse in propolis And propolis is that powerful of an antimicrobial, antibacterial protective agent that it encapsulates all the bacteria from this decaying rodent and protects the entire hive. I am so surprised that Disney or like one of these cartoon companies hasn't come out with like a bee story or like a really like, I mean, if they have, I totally missed it. But this is like sort of blowing my mind. It seems unbelievable to me (laughs) that they just have a doormat of problems. (laughs) Oh, I know. I know. The bees are so sophisticated. They're just like, I go down endless rabbit holes and I feel like I know a lot about bees, but I'm constantly learning more. Um, But propolis is really the immune system of the hive. It's their main protective agent. And then if you look at humans, the first recorded human use of propolis dates back to 300 BC. So this isn't some like new phenomenon. This is literally what we were using before the advent of modern medicine. And across cultures too, the Incas used to drink propolis to reduce fever. Um, in ancient Greek society, they used to put it topically on any sort of ab- abscess or like wounds, stuff like that. Even going back to you know the 17th century, propolis was listed in the London Pharmacopedia as an official drug. So its medicinal effects have been really widely recognized um, across different cultures, but they haven't really been isolated and they really have not been well known in North America. And I think a lot of that is because honeybees are not native to North America. They were brought over by European settlers. So, you know, by the time we got honeybees, we were looking at them for pollination and for the most obvious and delicious tasting product, honey. So all of these kind of medicinal effects were really lost on us. But then if you look at other cultures, you know, look at my experience when I was in Europe, it's very, very commonplace. And so propolis, what it is, it's just a really great immune supporter. It's antibacterial, antimicrobial, anti-inflammatory. It's, I use it just for kind of daily immune support. And then if I'm feeling run down or I feel like a tickle in my throat, I'll just double up and take, you know, a huge amount of propolis. And I find that doing that, you can really kind of zap whatever is coming on before it starts. Um, But beyond immune support, it's really fantastic for inflammation, really great for gut health. Uh, One of the highest antioxidant counts of, you know, pretty much anything. I think it's higher on the ORAC chart than blueberries. Uh, And it's just a really nourishing protective agent. So the same way the bees use it as their defender. I like to think of propolis as like my daily defense bodyguard in a bottle situation. So I know you guys have a a propolis throat spray. Would that be something like during flu season and that you you would just be like, oh, just like spray a couple of sprays in your throat. Is there a time of day that you would do this? And then when you're starting to feel run down, you sort of keep it in your purse and add and can your kids have it? And um, are there any like contraindications or anything we should be worried about? So propolis is a really safe substance. Um, This is why I love it as well, because I am like the most autoimmune reactive human being ever. And propolis is really soothing on the system. And we have like, we, you know, at this point, we have a, a lot of different types of customers, but in the early days, 
we were really championed by people with all kinds of autoimmune conditions and all kind, people who are typically super reactive. It was a, we had a lot of customers with different autoimmune and then a lot of customers who are members of the Lyme community. So people who generally have to be really careful with what they put in their body. Mm -hmm. Um, Propolis tends to be really well tolerated. Our propolis spray as well, it's completely pure. All that's in that bottle is propolis, non-GMO vegetable glycerin and purified water. So there's no additives, sweeteners, any of that. And then because we do the third-party pesticide testing, it's really clean. So it's really safe for kids and adults. We actually have a kid's propolis spray which is a combo of our propolis and buckwheat honey. And that was just, again, based on that study. Um, And then our adult propolis spray, it's just pure propolis. And so for me, I take propolis, I do three sprays a day every morning. I'll just kind of have it first thing with my breakfast. I put it on my bedside table so I don't forget. And I'll keep it in my purse. And then I find during cold and flu season or you know, if I'm traveling or anytime I really want to kind of bolster my natural defenses, I'll just basically double dose. So we tell people anywhere from like three to 10 sprays a day. Um, you can totally go beyond that. It has very low toxicity. I think the toxicity was equivalent to drinking 200 bottles and that's if you're the size of a rat. So you know, people <laughs> are not really going to get close to that. Um, so it's a really safe, well-tolerated substance. I think, you know, if you're doing three sprays once, twice or three times a day, you are definitely, you know, more than supporting your immune system in the right way. And it can be used both reactively when you have that sore throat, when you feel like you're getting sick, you can use it as your medicine and preventatively. And so I really do use it as both. I also have a very sensitive system and have to be really careful about getting sick. And for me, propolis has been the substance that's really stabilized my immune system and really radically changed my health. Yeah. Wow. I mean, it's such an amazing story. And I think it's, you know, things come up for me just in all that you've said. Like, obviously, I have clients with autoimmune diseases and Lyme disease, and I have a child with eczema. And, you know, I'm thinking of like all of us dealing with COVID and now flu season, and they're calling it, you know, a double pandemic or whatever for flu season and what we'll be worried about. But, you know, I'm also pregnant and in my third trimester and getting sick when you're pregnant, like you're not taking over the counter medications. It's not something I would do anyways, but has there been anything tested with propolis and, and pregnancy? I mean, it's a food grade ingredient, so I would feel like it would be fine, but I'm just curious if there's anything that you've seen. So specifically for pregnancy, we always recommend that people check with their primary healthcare provider. Of course. That being said, we have tons of customers that have used propolis all through their pregnancies. Um, one of my one of our beekeepers, she's actually pregnant right now and she's using propolis and living it up and feeling really great. By the way, you mentioned eczema. Propolis is amazing topically. So if I ever have any skin issues, I sometimes I'll like mix it with my I'll spray it literally into my body lotion, mix it up and put it all over. Um, or even if I have like a cut or a bug bite, I'll use propolis because it's so powerful for inflammation. Also unbelievable for burns, whether you have a sunburn or you, you know, burn yourself in the kitchen, spray the propolis spray all over it. And like, it's unbelievable how powerful it is for inflammation and those sort of things. But, but yeah, I think, you know, all of our products are super clean, super pure. We have all of our customers who, you know, or most of our customers have used these things throughout their pregnancy. The one bee product that I tell people to avoid during pregnancy is royal jelly Mm -hmm. just because it's a hormone balancer. And so you don't want to be taking, whether it's maca or whatever it is, you don't want to be taking anything that touches hormones or is like, you know, trying to stabilize them while your body (laughs) is doing its natural thing. Yeah. Uh, Propolis is a really fantastic tool to use just for general immune health. Great. Awesome. Okay. So now we have to talk about bee pollen and royal jelly. Yeah. So royal jelly, because I mentioned it, I'll, I'll, I'll get into that one. So in the beehive, and just another recap, honey is the carbs, propolis is the medicine. Royal jelly is like the superfood or the anti-aging food in the beehive. And so all newborn baby bees will eat royal jelly for the first three days of development. And then they'll be transitioned off of royal jelly onto a pollen that's you know, more typical of bees of honey, made up of honey and pollen. And so they'll, they'll stop taking the royal jelly after the first few days. 
move on to honey and pollen. And only the bee who's to become the queen continues with her exclusive royal jelly diet. And the biological changes that just happen in the beehive with this little bee that's having nothing but royal jelly are pretty remarkable. So the queen bee will live three to five years versus a regular bee during foraging season who will live six to eight weeks. The queen bee will lay, you know, around 1,500 babies a day versus regular female bees that don't have reproductive organs. And the queen bee is just much more robust. She's stronger. She, she looks, if anybody wants to Google a queen bee versus a regular worker bee, you'll see the difference or it's all over our Instagram or <laughs> photos. Um, but the queen bee is, you know, very noticeably different than the other bees. And so biologically, royal jelly is clearly doing some stuff in nature. And then for humans, again, royal jelly has been used across cultures for different things. Um, traditional Chinese medicine really looks at royal jelly for supporting energy levels as looking at it as an anti-aging tonic and for immune stabilization or sorry, not immune, hormonal stabilization. And so I know I've seen a lot of TCM providers that when they're taking someone off birth control, they'll put them on some sort of royal jelly product and use it in that way. And then in the Western world, royal jelly has really been focused on for its effects on the brain. So royal jelly has some incredible um, neurological effects. It's really fantastic for focus, memory, concentration. There was a study that came out of University of Warsaw that found that regular consumption of royal jelly actually improves spatial reasoning. So wow. me, one of our products is royal jelly. I actually built it for my best friend who, who now is the CEO of our company. But at that time, he was just my best friend who had a really serious concussion. And so I put together this formula for him of a few different adaptogens and some royal jelly. And it had he had a really incredible response. And when I saw that, I started using it just for focus. And it was, you know, during my kind of end stage of Goldman where I was still not sleeping and having to like give it 110% in the day. And I started using Royal Jelly and I found that it was really helping with my concentration and my memory. And that's kind of how my relationship has evolved with it. I use Royal Jelly as a nootropic and as a brain tonic um, and more and more, we're kind of seeing people relying on royal jelly for everything from brain fog to concussion recovery. So that's really exciting. And I know with work from home, royal jelly has been like a very key tool for me. So that is royal jelly. And then the last one... Question. Sorry. I just want people to have action steps. So like if someone had a concussion, how long would you have someone supplement with royal jelly if they were like, I just want to do it for a short period of time and I want to make sure that I'm healing and using this product appropriately or if they're using it to I mean has anyone ever used it to come off of any type of amphetamine patients or like an Adderall or anything like that we have tons of customers I have some close friends included in that who have used it to come off of different study drugs mm -hmm. um, I'm we're seeing a lot of that in our customer base a lot of young people who you know, kind of abuse study drugs in college because these things are unfortunately so accessible. Yeah. Entering the workforce, taking their health into their own hands and starting to think about the long-term effects and looking for something natural to bridge that gap. So we've had a ton of customers that will use our Belixir shots to kind of bridge that gap and support focus, memory, concentration as they're coming off something that's kind of aggressive on their brain. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about our Belixir formula, this is the formula I made for my friend with the concussion, What's in there is royal jelly, which I just went over, and then bacopa monieri, which is an adaptogen. It's an extract from a leaf traditionally used in Ayurveda. And then ginkgo biloba, which is an extract from a tree, um, also an adaptogen traditionally used in Chinese medicine. So there's three ingredients in there. Two of them are adaptogens, so they help to modulate the stress response. Um, they also have really helpful effects on the brain. So ginkgo is really great for promoting circulation in the brain and reducing inflammation. And then Bacopa is a neuroprotective agent. So it helps to protect your brain from carcinogens or any kind of, even just shielding it from the harmful effects of stress as adaptogens do. Mm -hmm. um, and then the royal jelly in there is really healing for the brain. So whether you're coming off of a drug that's been sort of detrimental or you're struggling with concussion, royal jelly is really helpful for two reasons. Well, a few reasons, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and distill it a little bit. So 
Royal jelly, it's one of the only naturally occurring sources of acetylcholine, Mm. which is a neurotransmitter responsible for brain-body connection. So you can literally think of royal jelly as supporting your transmission system. It helps your brain to communicate with your body and it helps to kind of refine and fine-tune that process. So that is, you know, incredibly supportive just for fast thinking, but also as we age and, you know, our body kind of depletes itself, helping to support these processes and and keep them sort of sharp. Royal jelly also contains two fatty acids. One of them is called 10-HDA and the other is called AMPN1 oxide. And these fatty acids act as catalysts for neurogenesis. So they they basically help to promote BDNF or brain-derived nootropic factor. And I'm using a lot of words to basically say that royal jelly helps the brain to create new neurons. So it, it literally helps with cell turnover. It, hel- it helps assist your brain in carrying out the healthy functions that your brain should, but that gets impaired from everything from lack of sleep to exposure to toxins, to stress. Um, it really helps your brain to carry out the executive functions that you want it to. So for me, I had a really severe concussion last year now it was um, I actually fainted from dehydration and cracked my head open on a concrete floor. So that was not great. Yikes. Yeah, it was not great. But I used RB Elixir shots and they were really a key component of my recovery. And what I was doing is I would do the first two weeks, I did a full shot, I think five days a week. And then I started to do half a vial. So I would just break open the vial, drink half of it, put the cap on, have the rest the next day. That's a great way to make it more cost effective. And it's a really high potency formula. So it, it definitely got the job done for me. And then now I've, you know, I've made a full recovery at this point, but I, I'll use our Belixir shots at least five days a week. Like usually now for me in the afternoon, I've cut out coffee. So I'll do my second or I'll do my um, Belixir shot in place of what would be my like afternoon caffeinated beverage. And I find that it just really helps with productivity. Um, But it's a really nice formula because it's great for rehabilitation if you are coming off something or dealing with an injury. And then it's also really fantastic for just general maintenance and maintaining the health of one of our most vital organs. That's great. That's a great explanation and I appreciate it. Of course. Yeah. So the the last B product on the list, and this is one that I'm sure a lot of your listeners are familiar with because it's been getting a lot of airtime is bee pollen. So yeah. Bee pollen, that is the protein source of the bees. So honey is the carbs, propolis is the medicine, royal jelly is the sort of brain food, and pollen is the protein. And literally what the bees do is they go flower to flower, they mix the pollen with their enzymes and then kind of pack it into these balls. And then they stick it to their hind legs. It's called their pollen pants, which is a very cute name for it. <laughs> the bees will fly back to the hive with these balls of pollen sort of mixed with their enzymes um, and bring it back that way. And it's, it's really, it's just their protein source. And so bee pollen has more protein per weight than any animal source. So more protein per weight than beef, cheese, eggs, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, so it's really fantastic for anyone with a nutritional deficiency because it's just kind of a power source of vitamins, minerals, and nutrients. So how I like to think of bee pollen, it's kind of nature's multivitamin. It's like these little sprinkles that have broad spectrum vitamins and minerals. So it, it's a good source of protein. Um, mind you, again, it's per weight. So it's not, you know, you're not going to get 20. You've need a lot of pollen to get the 20 grams there. Right. <laughs> It's a great protein source. And more than that, it's a multivitamin. So it's really high in B vitamins, which are fantastic for energy. Really awesome for anybody who's on a plant-based diet who just wants to get those B vitamins in. It's got vitamin C, uh, A, E, really broad spectrum. And then it's full of live enzymes. And our pollen as well, it's completely raw. So all of those enzymes are intact. So you see a lot of people using it, you know, if they have nutritional deficiencies, if they're just looking to kind of Maybe they live a fast-paced life and are trying to kind of cover their bases. Um, that's why I use it. I really use it as my multivitamin pretty much. Uh, it also is full of branched-chain amino acids, so really great for post-workout recovery. And there's actually a study done looking at athletes in Eastern Europe, um, and it was looking at the effects of bee pollen on endurance. And it found that with bee pollen, it increases your blood hemoglobin values. So it helps basically to 
oxygenate the tissues when you're kind of undergoing some sort of physical task. And so it's really helpful for supporting endurance. So I see a lot of people who will use pollen before a workout to support endurance and then also after a workout for muscle recovery. One sort of misconception about pollen, and I know it's really pretty, so you want to like dump it on your smoothie bowl and put it on Instagram, but I see <laughs> people using huge amounts of pollen. Yeah. And if it's, you know, not raw or it's kind of a lower quality source, that's probably fine. But for beekeepers, naturals, pollen, you really don't need that much. Like, you know, you need like a spoon of it. Um, so when I see our customers who are kind of dumping it on their smoothie bowl, like, <laughs> like I want to regram this, but you're using it incorrectly. <laughs> yeah. Like, you don't need that much because it's raw. So all the nutrients are so readily available. We also do see people using pollen for allergies. And that's, I think, what it's kind of been known for. I don't love that that's its reputation because I think allergies are so specific to the person. And microdosing with the allergen is not always right. It can be way too much for some people. Right. So what I actually recommend for allergies is propolis. So propolis, it's super anti-inflammatory. And they've actually found that propolis reduces the histamine response. So that's where I like to start people. And then if their allergies are pretty mild, I'll say, okay, try some pollen. But really, I think of pollen as like an energy boosting, natural way to get vitamins and minerals. I'm also just so not a fan of multivitamins because I think we titrate things. We don't know you know, what the binding agents are in a lot of our supplements. I don't always love the way things are formulated, not thinking about how things interact effectively. And so to me, pollen's like this completely natural, very complete food source that allows you to get all the vitamins that your body's kind of craving. Do you ever test your, like the nutrient levels in your bee pollen to understand like what is the breakdown of B vitamins and like in your, you know, in your um, bee pollen granules? Mm -hmm. So we've done a few different tests. We haven't done it where we've looked at the granules specifically, but mm -hmm. we have looked at like quantities of these different vitamins. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell you offhand, but... Just curious, yeah. We, no, it's definitely something that we look at. Our whole thing is blending the world of science and nature. Because I think there's such a division between kind of traditional Western medicine and the sort of more, you know, both traditional Eastern and then also these kind of more nuanced natural concepts. And so our whole mission at Beekeepers Naturals is to practice the kind of scientific rigor typical of the pharmaceutical world, but do so using only natural ingredients. So all of our products, they're, you know, come from plant-based ingredients or hive-based ingredients. And they're all, you know, it's all stuff that comes from the earth, but it's all arranged and put together with a very strong chem team that's you know, more traditionally used to working with pharmaceuticals. And we do things like we're testing for bioavailability, we're practicing the pesticide testing, we're looking at um, how the different ingredients work together and looking at quantities. And everything that we bring to market has been formulated in accordance with a third-party study. So you know, we're not claiming to have all the answers. Um, what we do is we work with incredible scientists who have a lot more answers um, and we formulate things in accordance with published science. So that's how we're kind of trying to look at things. So I love that question. And we're always kind of challenging ourselves to go a little bit more deeply into the science, into the formulation and really understand the, the way these natural compounds interact with humans. Well, I think you're doing the first, you're, you're, you're doing a great job of, of all of that. And you're also protecting your clients and the people who are purchasing it by just protecting them against pesticides and above all else cause no harm, right? I think that's like, that is our job and to give people resources and you're doing that too. So I think I want to end today's podcast just with a little understanding of, of bees for people out there. I mean, I feel like you took me to bee school, <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> But it's, uh, you know, just to understand, because I don't think people realize that bees are suffering massive losses and that they're risking extinction and that they're responsible for some of our favorite foods like avocados and almonds and all kinds of stuff. So um, I think avocados, I know almonds for sure. You're right about both of those. Okay. Yeah. So I just would love for you to kind of explain like, 
if you can, like, obviously the pesticides are playing a role, but like what's happening and how can we help or how can, you know, what, what can we do? Definitely. Yeah, no, this, I'm so happy that we're spending some time on this because it's critically important. So I'll start here. The bees pollinate one third of our food supply. And so what that means when I say the bees pollinate, it means there are plenty of food crops that can't self-reproduce. They can't reproduce on their own. And so they rely on pollinators on different creatures like bees and butterflies and birds to reproduce, to literally carry the male part of the plant into the female part of the plant and combine them in that way. So most of our, a lot of our food crops cannot reproduce without the help of the bees. So, you know, certain crops from almonds to blueberries to avocados to cucumbers to squash, even coffee is partially bee pollinated. So, you know, our, our crops literally could not produce enough yield to sustain life without the bees. Like if we were to lose the bees, we would have a massive food shortage. And the things that we would be, you know, in short supply of are all of the natural fruits and vegetables that we really rely on that, you know, people really need to stay healthy. And then beyond just human consumption, the bees pollinate over 40% of wildflowers. So the effects that would kind of ripple down the food chain if we lost the bees would be complete devastation. So it's really important that we help the bees and support the bees. And what we've seen over the past few years is a continuous decline in global bee populations, which is terrifying because again, the bees, they're these tiny little insects that are actually the pillars and you know foundational parts of our entire ecosystem. And there's a few reasons that we've seen the bees decline over the past few years. And there's a lot of debate around this. Um, you know, a lot of debate that's sparked by the pesticide companies, which are massive industries kind of built on poisoning a lot of our wildlife. I have some strong opinions here. If you can <laughs> I like it. Bring your passion. <laughs> but so what's been happening over the past few years, a few things. So one, just the change in our agricultural system. I mentioned it a little bit when we were talking about local farms in the olden days versus today. Um, they, it's all monocultures. It's, you know, all about fast pace and, you know, maximizing yield. So we're not, you know, taking the thoughtful approach that I wish that we were. And so with monocrops, it means that the bees don't have a varied food source. And often what will happen is there's, there's infrequent bloom. So when you have all of one type of crop somewhere, there's periods of the year where, there's, where they're in bloom and there's tons of food. And then when they're not blooming, it's a food desert. So structurally, that's happening. Urbanization is another big one. We're just losing green space. Um, you know, there's climate change, of course, is playing a huge role. It's incredibly confusing for the bees, particularly bees that are hibernating in cool places that have weird warm spells. But the number one, in my opinion, the number one issue affecting the bees that I really believe we can rectify is pesticides. So in 2006, DDT, which was the main pesticide at that time, was taken out of the game. Mm -hmm. And it was very quickly replaced with a substance called neonicotinoid pesticides. And neonics or neonicotinoid pesticides, it's a neuroactive substance. It's the most commonly used class of pesticides. And it really affects the bee's spatial reasoning. And so these pesticides as well, neonics, they're not necessarily sprayed on the plants. Sometimes they're sprayed. Other times the seeds are literally dipped in the neonicotinoid pesticide, and it grows up through the plant's vascular system. So it's like in the plant, which is kind of scary and gross. Mm -hmm. um, they're also water soluble. So it's degrading our soil and getting into our water supply. So tons and tons of issues. Um, it's really fascinating as well, because certain parts of the world have banned the use of neonics. There's quite a few places in Europe. In Canada, there's a partial ban in certain provinces. Um, because of pesticide regulation, for my company, we actually do a lot of our beekeeping outside of the U.S. because it's really hard to find pesticide-free areas because um, the bees will forage for a five-mile radius. So we basically can't have pesticides in any five miles of our bees. <laughs> Calling all your neighbors, hey, yeah. <laughs> can you stop using your your uh, neonicotinoid? How do you say it? Neonicotinoid. You can call them neonics for short, sure, but neonics. Yeah, really, I'm like, I'm also that person that like will annoy people and like ask them what they're actually doing in their garden. Um, 
So that's a whole other issue. But neonics are, are really dangerous. And so I think it's really important on the consumer level, one, to just pay attention to your own food uh, when possible. And if possible, shopping organic or local, supporting kind of biodynamic growers, people who have variants in their crop type, and really supporting growers who are willing to stop using neonics. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean they're certified organic. Sometimes it's just a conversation uh, and you realize that People couldn't afford the organic certification or it didn't make sense or, you know, there's a lot of reasons for it, but really doing what you can to support growers that are not using the poisonous pesticides that are killing the creatures of our planet and likely harming us. Um, And then in your own lawns, like so many people without realizing it have gardeners or are using, you know, different products from their local garden store that actually contain these pesticides that are really damaging, not just for the bees, but for us, for our kids and dogs and anyone walking barefoot on our lawn. So really starting to pay attention to that. And then a really simple thing that I encourage everyone to do to make a really a difference with, you know, everything that's happening with the bees is plant things. If you can just have, even if you look like for me, uh, when I was living in LA in my apartment, I had a balcony garden and Basically, you know, knowing that so much of the bees' food sources are covered in pesticides and that with urbanization and with the sort of changes in the agricultural structure, the bees aren't necessarily getting access to the food they need and they're not getting a very diet like, you know, you want to see. Um, so just planting organic heirloom, untreated seeds and having a little garden, it's a great way to provide some fuel for the bees. And if you're in a very hot place, a nice thing to do as well is have a little bee bath. So I know we we're, we all know about bird baths, but the bees get really hot and thirsty too in the summer. So having like a little bowl with some rocks and moss for the bees to perch on um, where they can go and take some sips is really helpful as well. So just two little things you can do in your home um, and a great great way to introduce your, your kids to the bees and the important effects they have having like a little pollinator habitat and a bee garden and bee bath. I love that so much. It's so amazing what you've been able to do and how you've been able to impact not only like the, the bee, I want to say the bee industry, but like just to educate and to like make these products accessible. I mean, I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm rarely like sold on, on anything. And it just seems like there's, it's just a win, win, win all the way around for like the planet, for people and just in the vein of doing no harm. It's just, it, it, especially at this time of year. And it's just really cool, Carly. I'm, I'm really excited to, to share your story and, um, and just all the information. We literally went to B school and it was gr- the greatest. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's such a privilege to be able to chat with you and share this story. And that's really what Beekeepers Naturals is about. No sacrifices. We think people should have access to the clean medicines and remedies that they need. And we think that we should have a really positive impact on our earth in the process. So that's what we're striving for. You're good people, Carly. Where can people follow along? Where can they find your products? I'm going to go shop myself right now. (laughs) So we are all over social media. Our Instagram is beekeepers underscore naturals. You can find us on Facebook as well. Our website is beekeepersnaturals.com. We also have an awesome blog. So if anyone's looking to learn more about products, recipes, or the bee cause, we have tons of information there. We're all about educating people about how to have an impact in the bee crisis and how to be on the right side of history. So please do check it out. And you can also find all of our products at your local Whole Foods. Amazing. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing your story and you know, I think your own personal journey has really brought a, a beautiful silver lining for all of us. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Be Well by Kelly. Please subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Learn more at bewellbykelly.com and follow me on Instagram at bewellbykelly. I would love if you picked up my books, Body Love and Body Love Every Day. They're sold on Amazon and at all major booksellers.